Check out today's piece of Otaku Daikun fan art. Here we've got a lovely rendition of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Hmm, I don't think mirrors are supposed to work that way. <laughs> Perhaps that's the point. Thank you so much, Kigai Okasu. Welcome back to Otaku Daikun! Dai here! We finally arrived at the third Lost Belt in Fate Grand Order, Sin, Land of Unified Knowledge, also known as the Chinese Lost Belt. As usual, there is a lot to cover, so let's dive right in. The chapter starts off with another journal entry from David Blue Book, one of the few survivors of the Earth's bleaching. He's still cruising along on his motorcycle, en route to Area 51, hoping to catch some rogue Naruto fans. He recalls some more details about the initial attack. On New Year's Eve, every one of Earth's satellites went down, preventing humanity from effectively observing the various tree branches that covered the planet like a dome. Twelve hours later, tree-like tentacle creatures swarmed the planet, exterminating all life over the following three months. Then suddenly, the trees vanished, leaving the world a desolate white. This is far more brutal than originally described, detailing horrors that Caldea never got to witness. We were too busy trying to survive being attacked by Anastasia and the Aprichniki. These aliens, despite having destructive weaponry, chose to eradicate the planet by hand, allowing only a handful of survivors who hid underground. I'm genuinely curious to get a visual on these tree aliens, both the one at Area 51 and the creatures attacking the Earth. For now, all we've got are these Blue Book journals. Last we left off, the remnants of Caldea, traveling in the Shadow Border, had just dissolved the Norse Lost Belt. This gave us a clear path to reach coordinates specified by an Atlas mage named Sion Eltnem Sakaris. We'd put our trust in her, hoping to take refuge in the Wandering Sea, the third branch of the Mages Association, normally hidden away in its own texture of reality. As such, when the border gets close enough to our destination, it suddenly plunges into a torrential ocean. The Wandering Sea's headquarters is a giant, mountainous fortress surrounded by storms. We freak out as the border sinks, but quickly realize we're actually entering the Wandering Sea via a strong current, and it's now safe for us to go exploring. Ritsuka, Mashu, and Da Vinci step out of the border and find the Wandering Sea's docks. There, we finally meet Sion, a cheerful and overall welcoming girl with a scholarly aura to her. Let's not beat around the bush. Fans of Tsukihime will no doubt recognize this girl as Sion Eltnem Atlassia from the Melty Blood games. Turns out, they're both the same person, having lived through different events on separate timelines. Melty Blood Sion had a run-in with a dead apostle, the Knight of Wallachia, and wound up a vampire herself. Since neither true ancestors nor dead apostles are at all common in Fate Grand Order's timeline, our current Sion never had this problem, and as such remains a part of the association in a much healthier state. Now, it's been a while since FGO's story had anything to do with the Atlas Institute, but hopefully you do remember that it's a branch of the Mages Association based in Egypt. Back when we were in the Camelot Singularity, we first met Sherlock at the Atlas Temple, where we accessed its giant Spiritron supercomputer Tri-Hermes. At the time, this computer's database helped provide us valuable information on King Solomon. Beyond that, however, Atlas technology has been absolutely essential in the formation and survival of Caldea. For instance, Trismegistus, the computer Caldea uses for its rayshift system, is actually a sister unit of Trihermes. In addition, the Paper Moon, the device needed for the Shadow Border to navigate void space, was also a product of Atlas tech. Specifically, it turns out that both Trismegistus and the Paper Moon were both created by Sion, making her quite the brilliant mage. These projects were handed to her after she was adopted by the Atlas director, Zepia Eltnam Atlassia. He served as a doting father figure to her, and in turn, she remained his most talented pupil. In fact, she's so brilliant that she foresaw the alien god's invasion well before it happened. Despite this knowledge, however, she received no aid to prevent it. You see, Atlas mages are pretty much always looking into ways the world might end. They each have their own visions and predictions of the future to deal with. As such, none of the Atlas mages, not even Zepia, could spare any time or resources to give her. Instead, they were all, it's your vision, you do something about it. Which truly shows just how arrogant and self-centered mages can be. Thankfully, Sion wasn't about to let that stop her. 
She calculated that, of all places in the world, the Wandering Sea would be able to survive the planet's bleaching, and so she moved there to continue her research. The actual mages of the Wandering Sea couldn't care less about the end of humanity, but they did allow Sion to stay so long as she left them alone. As such, she had free reign of the Wandering Sea's entrance, with the other mages sealed into the fortress proper by a massive door. In order to develop a countermeasure against the alien god, Sion needed help, and so she, being the genius she is, invented a bootleg version of Caldea's fate system to summon a servant of her very own. That said, she wasn't able to summon a proper heroic spirit, and instead settled on creating a phantom spirit, similar to what we saw in Shinjuku. While this chapter only introduces this servant as Captain, I'm here to give you all the facts. Captain was created by combining the fictional character Captain Nemo with the Greek god Triton. In the novel 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Nemo was an Indian prince who traveled the oceans in his submarine, the Nautilus. This ship of his, similar to the Shadow Border, can navigate void space, and it was actually his presence that Caldea detected in the previous chapter. As an Atlas alchemist, Sion had an ability called Memory Partition, which allowed her to divide her own consciousness into multiple thought processes. It's an advanced form of mental multitasking, and Sion herself can manage up to seven partitions at a time. While this certainly helps explain her genius, it also grants her servant Nemo the ability to manifest separate forms of himself as individual bodies called the Nemo series. This adorable crew helps Sion and Nemo with their construction efforts, working together to turn the Wandering Sea's entryway into a replica of Caldea's base in Antarctica. Essentially, Sion's plan to fight back against the alien god hinged upon Caldea being able to survive the bleaching and find her. She could not prevent the attack, but she could provide Caldea a second, more impenetrable base of operations. So this is great! We can finally formulate an actual plan to conquer the other Lost Belts. Sion provides us a comprehensive world map that not only includes the location of the various Lost Belts, but also what she calls their Lost Belt Depths a scale of how greatly they refute proper human history. In other words, the greater a Lost Belt's depth, the more of a pain it will be to defeat. Her map shows three Lost Belts in Europe, two in Asia, one in South America, and one smack dab in the Atlantic Ocean. That last one is the most significant, as its fantasy tree, or Tree of Emptiness, is branching out all across the Earth's atmosphere. Sion suspects it's Kirstaria's Lost Belt, and since he's the leader of the Cryptors, that makes the Atlantic our main target. Before we can actually reach this Lost Belt, however, some renovations need to be made. For one, the Shadow Border isn't capable of oceanic travel, and two, our new base, Novum Caldea, has yet to be entirely finished. As such, we take the time to relax as Sion and her servant continue their construction of the facility. Munier, of all people, seems particularly taken by the flock of Captain Nemo boys. He's got a thing for cute, androgynous men. Oh, and regarding Mashu and her Ortnax, Sion has some suggestions on how to improve her combat potential. Considering she's effectively nerfed, I'd love to see what she has in mind regarding the Black Barrel, but that will be relevant for another video. Meanwhile, the Cryptors have a meeting where Koyanskaya reports the death of Ophelia and her Lost Belt. The news is taken differently by each cryptor, but Kirstaria specifically takes Ophelia's loss as a sign that he should live up to the greatness she saw in him. Kadok is apparently laying low at the Greek Lost Belt, with his role as a cryptor called into question. They discuss how Caldeas reached the Wandering Sea and how they underestimated it as a potential safe haven. All of the surviving cryptors now see Ritska as a genuine threat and request that Koi and Skaya find a way to eliminate us. Sure enough, she claims to have a means of reaching the Wandering Sea, but if the alien god wasn't able to touch it, how could she? Well, it turns out we have Gordolf to thank for that. Back when Koyanskaya and Gordolf were discussing the acquisition of Caldea, the buffoon was simping pretty hard. Koyanskaya toyed with Gordolf, insisting the two of them could be together in due time. Until then, she entrusted Gordolf with a container of lipstick, saying that so long as he holds on to it, she will return to him. I suppose this must have slipped Gordolf's mind, because even as enemies, he foolishly still has the lipstick on his person. And she can use it as a catalyst to secretly infiltrate the Wandering Sea. As such, after Sion and her crew have nearly finished constructing the new Caldea, Koyanskaya sneaks into the facility's kitchen and bakes a poisonous cake, leaving with it a note saying it's meant for Ritska. 
Now, we already know that Ritsuka has a degree of poison immunity granted by Mashu's shield. It's why we can touch Hassan of Serenity without dying. But this new potion Koyan Sky has brewed up is especially potent. The full dose would be enough to kill any mage, which is why it's kinda great that Gordolf, in addition to being a simp, is also a glutton. At night, he sneaks into the kitchen and, even though the cake is labeled for Ritsuka, he decides to eat half of it himself as a taste test. Ritsuka catches Gordolf in the act and joins him to eat the other half. Only then do they realize that neither of them actually knows who made the cake. But it's too late. We're already feeling symptoms of poisoning. Nonetheless, Gordolf's spontaneous raid on the kitchen foiled Koyanskaya's attempt to assassinate us. And when she tries to finish us off directly, she's chased out by the captain. So yeah, Ritsuka and Gordolf are poisoned. Ritsuka is mostly safe, but we'll need to find an antidote soon if we don't want Gordolf to die. Problem is, the poison Koyanskaya made contained ingredients that no longer exist on Earth. They discover the poison is called Xian Shuai Mingmai and that it's exclusive to China. Thus, rather than going after the Atlantic Lost Belt, Caldea must now first target the Chinese Lost Belt. Not only do we hope to find ingredients for an antidote there, but our data also shows that Koyan Sky is in the Lost Belt. Perhaps we can capture her and snag an antidote right from the poison's creator. All in all, this isn't too much of a detour, given that we'd have to confront the other cryptors sooner or later anyway. Now, let's actually talk about this Lost Belt. As with all the other Lost Belts, this one is a world that has deviated significantly from proper human history. In this case, the divergence happened way back in 210 BC, during the reign of Qin Shi Huang. As his name implies, he was the first emperor of the Qin Dynasty, and is often regarded as the most celebrated figure in Chinese history. He unified mainland China in the year 221 BC, innovating the country with a prefecture system centered around a single power. He standardized currency, measurements, and even transportation routes. However, he was also regarded as a tyrant, forcing this unity by silencing scholars and burning books. Towards the end of his reign, Xin Shi Huang sought immortality in the form of an elixir of life. In proper human history, he obviously never found such a thing, but in this Lost Belt, he more or less did. Think back to when I covered the Salem Epic of Remnant. There, I first introduced Netza, the Buddhist warrior born from a gem dropped to the mortal realm of humans by Taiyi Jenren of Mount Kunlun. Upon committing suicide, Netza was revived into an artificial body made of mystical Pao Pei. In this Lost Belt, Qin Shi Huang got his hands on Netza's body and reverse engineered it to develop technology that would allow him to live on artificially. No longer fearing his mortality, he waged war with the entire world, and after many years of conflict, he finally conquered the planet to establish what he calls the Eternal Sin Empire. He rules this empire as a mechanical supercomputer at Epang Palace, suspended over the capital city of Xianyang. As an ultimate system of defense to protect his kingdom, he created a network of feathers surrounding the planet called the Great Wall. Not only does the Great Wall serve as a deadly weapon, it also enables him to monitor everything that can be seen from above. Now, despite this Lost Belt's technological advancement, Xin Shi Huang keeps the masses incredibly ignorant. Beyond his capital, humanity lives within farming villages with no access to technology, or education for that matter. He believes only an enlightened one like himself, a Genren, is worthy of the world's resources and knowledge. Humans as a collective conflict with one another, and as such, they are better kept blissfully ignorant. To that end, he delivers to the people drugs that cure all their illnesses and provides them a painless death before becoming old. This style of rule may be less pragmatic and more of a personal matter. In both this Lost Belt and proper human history, Qin Shi Huang despised Confucianism, the philosophical teachings of Confucius that influenced morals, art, and entertainment. Regardless, in his own way, he has preserved his Lost Belt for thousands of years without conflict. It's been far too long since he's actually needed warriors, which you've got to admit is pretty impressive. Now, let's shift our gears to the Lost Belt's cryptor, Hinako Akta. On the surface, she appears to be a quiet, reserved mage who would rather settle into a nice book than get involved with human drama. While this introverted personality is genuine, her appearance as a human is anything but. In truth, Hinako is actually a vampiric elemental, almost identical to that of a true ancestor. She was immensely powerful, able to tap into a nearly endless reserve of mana as a being born during the Age of Gods. This means she's been around for roughly 2,000 years. 
Originally, she wandered the Earth until settling down in China in the year 200 BC. There, she became a devoted concubine of Xiang Yu, a charismatic warrior who lived during the collapse of the Qin Dynasty. After all, she's from proper human history, and during that history, the Qin Dynasty did in fact come to an end. Originally, Xiang Yu was an artificial human built to serve the dynasty. His body was based on the same technology as Netza's body, but in proper human history, Qin Shi Huang had already passed away, and any attempts to seek immortality died with him. As such, Xiang Yu was abandoned in the Kuaiji Laboratory until being found by Xiang Liang, a man aiming to rule China after the dynasty's collapse. Xiang Liang, wanting to use Xiang Yu's inhuman power, adopted him as a nephew, and to all potential onlookers, Xiang Yu looked as human as they come. Despite his incredible might in combat, he was treated as a human and acted as such. Aside from Xiang Liang, the only other person to know his secret was Hinako, who learned the truth after becoming his wife. The two of them formed a connection because they were both feared by the outside world. As his consort, she took on the name Consort Yu, Yu Miao Yi, or more commonly, Yu Mei Ren. Eventually, Xiang Liang had died, and Xiang Yu took up arms against his rival Liu Bang in a competition to see who could become the next emperor. Generally speaking, nature spirits care about the Earth, protecting it over mankind, but Yu Mei Ren was able to put that aside for her affection for Xiang Yu. She fought alongside her beloved, wielding two blades in battle, but in the end, she could not protect him. During the Battle of Gai Xia, Yu Mei Ren was captured by enemy forces, and while trying to save her, Xiang Yu was tricked into thinking his own forces of Western Chu were already conquered in his absence. This crippled his army's morale, and defeat was inevitable. In his final moments, Xiang Yu sang the song of Gai Xia, a melody expressing his woes, as well as his aspiration for his wife to live on. Yu Mei Ren danced along to this tune, and while she lamented the death of her husband, she honored his wish by staying alive. She continued to roam China, striking fear into the hearts of the humans she now detested, until the year 500 AD when she met Gao Changgong, the Prince of Lanling during the Qi Dynasty. He was a high-ranking general who fought while wearing a mask to hide his beautiful, effeminate face. Unlike most people, when he met Yu Mei Ren, he did not fear her as an immortal vampire, and instead sincerely befriended her. This tranquility was short-lived, however, when Lan Ling's cousin Gao Wei ascended as emperor. Not trusting his former ally, Gao Wei ordered Lan Ling to death by poison. Despite knowing his own chalice was filled with poison, Lan Ling chose to drink it as penance for the people he had slain throughout his life. As he died, Lan Ling's final wish was to one day see Yu Mei Ren once more. Again, she was devastated by losing someone dear to her, and so she continued to resent humanity in solitude until the Common Era. She no longer wanted a role in human drama, but also struggled to avoid it. Marisbury Animosphere, you know, Caldea's former director, he found Yu Mei Ren and offered her a position as part of Team A. Her body was strong, able to resist even the most strenuous ray shifts. So Marsbury wanted her, and in exchange, he offered her a new identity as Hinako. To disguise herself as an ordinary human, she suppressed her powers as an elemental, hoping for peaceful solitude. Sure enough, Caldea did serve as a place where she could avoid the outside world, but of course that changed when Getia began the incineration of humanity. When Hinako was entrusted with a lost belt of her own like the other cryptors, she took the responsibility as a burden. She has no intention of having her Chinese lost belt outperform the others. Instead, her only interest comes from two things. For one, her servant in the lost belt happens to be the Prince of Lanling. After 1500 years, she was able to fulfill Lanling's dying wish for reunion. More importantly, this lost belt also happens to have its own version of her beloved husband, Xiang Yu. You see, in this lost belt, since Qin Shi Huang found immortality, he was able to gather various Chinese warriors to establish his empire of sin. Once the world had been conquered, however, he no longer needed them. In case he ever did need them, however, he kept these heroes preserved by freezing them for later use in Mount Li. One of these heroes just so happens to be the lost belt's Xiang Yu. Unlike his version from proper human history, Qin Shi Huang was actually able to use him for his intended purpose, a weapon to protect the dynasty. As such, Xiang Yu's body was better optimized for combat, with extra arms and a horse's torso. This version had never been raised as a human, and as such maintains the calculative mind of a machine. 
His only purpose is in his programming, to act in favor of a peaceful world. And he found the solution to that goal by serving Qin Shi Huang. By slaughtering his foes, Xiang Yu could simplify China, ushering in the calm, ignorant civilization his emperor believes in. Since he's a machine, he isn't frozen per se, but he has been decommissioned until he's needed again. One person who is being frozen is Qin Liang Yu, a female warrior who succeeded her husband as a general of the White Cavalry. She was the only female general in the written work History of Ming. She and her subordinates fought off bandits for the Chongzhen Emperor using spears made from ash wood. Mind you, this frozen Qin Liang Yu is not a servant, but the actual person who lived in this lost belt. As such, her history is a bit different. She had every intention of living a peaceful life with her family, but became a warrior after Zhang Xianzhong convinced her neighbors to form a rebellion, convinced that they could build a better life under their own nation. She confided in this sentiment, even though it meant opposing Qin Shi Huang's rule. As a group of peasants, however, they stood no chance, especially against the Emperor's Great Wall. In response to the uprising, Qin Shi Huang launched an orbital strike that annihilated her hometown. While she survived the blast, she was devastated, even more so after learning that Zhang Xianzhong abandoned the village and went elsewhere to recruit more followers. In the wake of this tragedy, Qin Liang Yu pledged herself to Qin Shi Huang and the peaceful world he had created. Instead of seeing her emperor as a cruel tyrant, she blamed herself for ever daring to defy him. Now that she's no longer needed, she remains in cryosleep, only to wake at the emperor's discretion. Another key figure in Qin Shi Huang's army is Han Xin, a great hero from the Han Dynasty in proper human history. He was a talented strategist, but perhaps an even greater warmonger, viewing peace as a tragic point where he has no enemies left to conquer. In the Lost Belt, he joined Qin Shi Huang to help conquer the world, leading armies to crush India, Rome, and Egypt. Never wanting to experience true peace for himself, Han Xin was more than happy to be retired in cryosleep, only ever waking to participate in further warfare. The final major figure in Qin Shi Huang's forces is somebody we already know from proper human history. It's Li Xuan, the martial artist we met back in America who was famous for being able to kill any opponent in a single strike. In the Lost Belt, he serves as the captain of Qin Shi Huang's royal guard and has been doing so for hundreds of years. I guess all that fancy tech under their belt can keep a human alive that long. Despite being quite the boomer now, this old man is still about as strong as he was in his youth. While the Emperor's personnel greatly attributed to his success, another major factor was his discovery of the Fusang Tree. Mythologically, it is known as the Tree of Life, filled to the brim with mystic wisdom. It is thanks to this tree that Qin Shi Huang could invent the potions he delivers to his ignorant masses. Beyond his knowledge, however, when the Lost Belt was chosen by the alien god, this Fusang tree actually became the host to this Lost Belt's fantasy tree, Mayal. When Hinako came to this Lost Belt, she intentionally kept Mayal's existence a secret from Qin Shi Huang. While he was the Lost Belt's king, she feared what he might do if he truly acknowledged the existence of other worlds than his own. Specifically, she feared that the Emperor would no doubt employ Xiang Yu in his attempt to fight the other Lost Belts. Not wanting her beloved to face such a daunting task, Hinako found it beneficial to keep Qin Shi Huang in the dark. So, yet again, that was a ton of info. Let's recap before moving forward. Caldea managed to obtain a new base of operations thanks to Sion, but before we could take action, Koyanskaya wound up poisoning both Ritska and Gordolf. Thanks to this, Caldea must prioritize the Chinese Lost Belt, which has the rare ingredients needed for an antidote. This Lost Belt diverged from proper human history when the Emperor Qin Shi Huang discovered Netsa's artificial body and used it to immortalize himself. He and his generals took advantage of superior technology to conquer the planet, after which he governed over the masses as a superior mechanical being. His warriors were frozen as he continued to nurture humans as ignorant livestock, until the arrival of Hinako, the Lost Belt's designated cryptor. She herself isn't actually human either. Rather, she is an incarnated elemental, an immortal vampiric being who has been alive since the Age of Gods. She loathes humanity, only ever loving her husband Xiang Yu and cherishing a friendship with the Prince of Lanling. After living at Caldea under the guise of a human, Hinako has suppressed her powers and only reluctantly accepts her role as cryptor for the chance to see her beloved husband once more, even if this world Xiang Yu isn't the same person at all. Just tell me you wouldn't want to see a doujin where these two consummate their reunion. <coughs>
Well, with that, we can finally go over the story proper. In preparation to enter the Lost Belt, Caldea assembles a team of servants known for their rebellious nature. One of these servants is Spartacus, the Thracian gladiator who led a slave revolt against his Roman oppressors. We met him during Septim, but here he seems to be a lot more conversational. Of course, you can't have a band of rebels without Mordred, the knight of treachery who killed King Arthur. She's been with us for quite a while now, and she's raring to kick some more ass. Another servant raring to visit this lost belt is Jing Ke, who we also met back in Septim. Conveniently, her entire legend revolves around trying to assassinate Qin Shi Huang during proper human history. Since she failed her mission during life, this lost belt serves as a second chance of sorts. Lastly, we also take along Netza, having no idea just how relevant she is to this lost belt's circumstances. With our party assembled, we zero sail into the Lost Belt and find ourselves among one of the many farming villages. The farmers first see us as a threat, but thanks to Da Vinci's cuteness and Sherlock's charm, we're able to negotiate peace. From the villagers, we learn that these are simple people who blindly worship Qin Shi Huang as their most glorious and majestic heavenly emperor. Shortly afterward, the village gets attacked by a group of Krichat, creatures that we encountered back in the Russian Lost Belt. The culprit is, of course, Koyanskaya and her NFF service company. She's made collecting and training monsters from the various Lost Belts a bit of a business venture. With the monsters defeated, Da Vinci sends a drone to the Lost Belt's capital, and we use its footage to learn how advanced China's technology is. Based on the state of the villages, though, we're able to speculate that Qin Shi Huang is the Lost Belt's king, and that he must have found a form of immortality. Back in the capital, Qin Shi Huang converses with Hinako about the state of their world. He finds it hard to believe the existence of other timelines, but views Hinako's own servant evidence to believe her. What he doesn't believe, however, is the idea that his perfect world is on the chopping block. Not seeing Kaldea as much of a threat, he allows Hinako to deal with them instead. Now, it turns out, all the Emperor's contact with the outside world is done remotely. He transports both goods and people by launching containers across the sky. Responding to Caldea's arrival, Hinako and her servant Lan Ling hitch a ride on one of these containers to confront the party. Hinako, normally quiet and reserved, is now far more aggressive, and this comes as a shock to those in Caldea who knew her. Mashu is once more reluctant to fight someone she considered to be a former ally, but at this point it ain't her first rodeo. When Lan Ling realizes he cannot breach her shield, he and Hinako flee. This battle isn't enough to convince Qin Shi Huang that we're a huge threat, so instead he orders her to return to the battlefield with reinforcements. As such, round two begins, this time with Lan Ling fighting alongside Automata from the capital. Again, the enemy is forced to flee. Upon failing twice, the Emperor reasons more soldiers won't make a difference, and instead authorizes Hinako to bring Xiang Yu to the battlefield. Naturally, she is delighted by the privilege. In addition, he orders Li Xuan to awaken the frozen warriors at Mount Li. On the mountain, Li Xuan is told that unfreezing warriors may cause them to go berserk, and so he agrees to take responsibility if such a thing occurs. Even so, this process takes some time, and during that time, Ritsuka's party hopes to help the villagers by eliminating the monsters at their nest. One of the village boys admits that he broke the rules and went out exploring. There, he found a cave that may just be their nest. We allow the boy to show us the way, and along the path, he learns from Spartacus what it means to truly be free. The boy watches as Caldea risks their own safety in pursuit of that freedom. We clear out the cave and return to the boy's village. At night, Jing Kei uses material from the slain monsters to make alcohol, and the villagers find her drinking and singing under the moonlight. When they inquire about her words, she explains that she's singing poems, and begins teaching the villagers what poems are. Back at the capital, Li Xuan returns with Han Xin and Xin Liang Yu, the former of which is excited to try out strategies with a fully automated army. At the same time, Xiang Yu is awake and prepared for combat. He is sent to attack via another rocket, and mid-flight, Mordred blows his container to bits with Clarent Blood Arthur. Surprisingly, though, it does nothing. Xiang Yu is just that strong. Luckily for us, he's only here to test our capabilities, and retreats to a nearby camp along with Lan Ling. At the camp, Hinako tries to explain how she knows the Xiang Yu from proper human history. The artificial juggernaut in front of her now has a hard time believing such a thing. While she has feelings for him, they are unrequited given his sworn loyalty to the Emperor. 
In contrast, Hinako is defiant, wanting to launch another attack, even though Qin Shi Huang has ordered her to wait, until Qing Liang Yu arrives as backup. At first, Hinako follows these orders, at least until Caldea makes the first move. Rather than waiting, we begin our march. Hinako tries to take the opportunity to reciprocate, but is told to stand down by Qing Liang Yu. As it turns out, the Emperor has his own plans for Caldea. Between Caldea and Hinako, Qin Shi Huang considers both potential threats, but unlike Hinako, he has something to gain from us. Specifically, he has taken interest in the Shadow Border. He wants to analyze it, and rather than fighting, tries to negotiate. Upon finding out that Caldea is searching for Koyanskaya, Qin Shi Huang says he will hand her over to us in exchange for our cooperation. We agree to these terms, and Koyanskaya, feeling betrayed, is knocked unconscious by Li Xuan. While the Emperor and his men investigate the border, he tells us about the Great Wall, his peaceful kingdom, and how we can observe the entire planet through the technology that is now his body. We don't exactly like being watched from the sky, though, and so Da Vinci whips up a couple of stealth devices modeled after Robin Hood's cloak, No Face May King. So long as we cooperate with the Emperor, Qin Liang Yu treats us with courtesy, but Hinako is quite the opposite. That night, she orders Lan Ling to ambush Ritsuka, defying the Emperor's orders. Qin Liang Yu helps us fend him off, and in order to punish Hinako for her insubordination, Qin Shi Huang orders Xiang Yu to crush the gold elixir in his chest. This is basically ordering Xiang Yu to kill himself, and as a devoted follower, he's sure to cooperate. Not wanting to lose her beloved again, Hinako begs Qin Shi Huang to spare him, offering absolute obedience in exchange. The Emperor agrees to her pleas, and recalls her, Lan Ling, and Xiang Yu from the village. Ritsuka's party, especially Spartacus, is reluctant to cooperate with Qin Shi Huang, and yet we agree to do so because Koyanskaya is a wild card. She could prove instrumental in creating an antidote for Ritsuka and Gordolf's poison. Despite these intentions, the truce is called off the moment Qin Liang Yu finds out that the villagers are learning poetry from us. She reports this to the Emperor, who is outraged to learn his villagers are being taught what he perceives as Confucian rhetoric. All hell breaks loose. Spartacus takes a group of villagers to experience the capital, Qin Liang Yu steals the Shadow Border, and Qin Shi Huang tries to exterminate the entire region with an orbital strike from the Great Wall. In the form of a burning star, death awaits us, and to save the day, Spartacus chooses to offer up his own life. With the help of a command seal, Spartacus leaps high into the sky and absorbs the blast by overloading his noble phantasm, crying warmonger. He vanishes, but only after instilling hope to the Lost Belt's people, inspiration to achieve freedom with a rebellious spirit. At first, this Lost Belt was entirely devoid of free servants, because the people were content with their ignorance. Having been enlightened, however, the people's yearning for freedom results in the summoning of two such servants, each of them famous for their exploits during China's Three Kingdoms era. One of them is Chen Gong, a wise military commander quite similar to Zhuge Liang, who we know through Waver. Initially, Chen Gong was a strategist serving Cao Cao, but ultimately betrayed him to serve Lu Bu, the intimidating warmonger we met back in Septum. Chen Gong was fascinated by Lu Bu's sheer strength, and found him fit to wield devastating weaponry such as the God Force. Seeing Lu Bu as a terrifying war god on par with Qi Yu, Chen Gong engineered his two-handled halberd in an attempt to make Lu Bu indestructible. Ultimately, however, both of these men met their end after being defeated by Cao Cao, the very person they'd initially betrayed. The other free servant is very closely related. Red Hair is, in fact, Lu Bu's famous horse, a massive steed said to have leapt over a castle trench more than 30 meters wide. That said, what we have here is a centaur of sorts, complete with human arms and chest armor. As a servant, Red Hair takes this as a sign that he is not merely a horse, but rather Lu Bu himself, or perhaps a combination of the two. The truth of this matter is meant to be more of a joke than anything. In practice, he's essentially a rider form of Lu Bu, wielding an imitation of Lu Bu's weapon, God Force. As free servants, these two clowns are more than happy to help Ritsuka in battle, but only if the Caldean Master can prove their strength. We encounter them while trying to recover the stolen Shadow Border, and after a display of combat, they join our cause. When the border was stolen, Da Vinci, Sherlock, Gordolf, and the other staff members were still inside. Rather than executing them, Qin Liang Yu had them imprisoned at a detention center in Ankang. 
Conveniently, it appears this is also where Koyanskaya was taken. On that note, it finally seems like karma has caught up with her. Hinako, for instance, never appreciated her deceptive attitude and is more than happy to leave her in jail. This leaves her at the whim of Qin Shi Huang, who isn't too happy that she came to this kingdom with monsters that terrorized his villagers. Restrained by a talisman that prevents her from fighting back, Koyanskaya has no choice but to endure as automatons brutally torture her. The machines drill holes all across her body, repeating this process day and night to study her properties as a servant. It's so visceral sounding that I kind of wonder what it would look like in manga form. Do you think she deserves this kind of punishment? Anyway, Ritsuka's party reaches the facility using Da Vinci's stealth device. We employ our patented Caldea infiltration strategy, that is, causing mayhem outside the front door so that someone else can sneak inside. In this case, Jing Kei slips past security and frees our captive comrades. In addition, we free Koyanskaya, but only after she promises to provide us with an antidote. Xin Shi Huang never suspected Caldea had technology small enough to communicate in secret, and so news of the attack perplexes him. His arrogance and sense of grandeur wind up being his hubris. Nevertheless, the prison is guarded by Hinako and Lan Ling, and to escape, we'll have to get through them. Koyanskaya holds off most of the guards by conjuring a Yatun from Scandinavia, while we battle Lan Ling. During the fight, Koyanskaya sets off an explosive trap she made, mortally wounding Hinako. Despite once being a powerful vampire, Hinako had suppressed that power to live at Caldea. In such a state, her wound can actually kill her. Seeing this, Lan Ling begs her to use him as a sacrifice. If she feeds on him, she can regain her strength as an elemental on par with true ancestors. She is reluctant, but ultimately cooperates for the sake of a future with her husband. Hinako devours her own servant, casting aside her current identity to once again be Yu Mei Ren. Despite being nerfed in the actual game, Yu Mei Ren is on the verge of destroying the party. Before she can, however, Xin Shi Huang asks that she remember their agreement. Surprisingly, this is enough to calm her, and she returns to the capital on the Emperor's order. Now, personally, I want to clarify that technically, Yu Mei Ren is not actually a true ancestor as Da Vinci claims she is. It's semantic, but Yu is a separate type of being with extremely similar characteristics. I can only assume this is because timelines with the Throne of Heroes aren't supposed to have any true ancestors. But if that's true, why would anyone know about them? Feel free to provide clarity if you can. Back at the capital, Qin Shi Huang is fascinated to meet another immortal. He thanks Yu Mei Ren for her service, and arranges a place where she can take Xiang Yu and live peacefully in the Lost Belt while she can. She no longer cares about the competition between cryptors, and feels that there's no way Caldea can win against the Emperor's frozen warriors. After escaping the prison, the members of Caldea are reunited. We keep Koyanskaya tied with her hands behind her back, as Gordolf and Foe go to town on her vulnerable state. Nothing that wouldn't be safe for work, mind you. Hey, Dojin artists! You've got work to do! As promised, she hands over the antidote, but it's only a single dose she kept for herself as insurance. Since Gordolf is the closest to death without Mashu's poison resistance, we force him to take it against his will, even though Ritsuka is qualitatively more valuable as a master. Thankfully, we learn from Koyanskaya that the poison was made using the Fusang tree, and we could theoretically make another dose of antidote since it's still here in the Lost Belt. That becomes our top priority, but before we can seek out the tree in the capital, Qin Shi Huang unleashes the fruits of his analysis on the Shadow Border, a series of replicas adorned with golden tigers. Oddly enough, these replicas are flimsy, using inferior armor to what the actual border uses. Just the sight of them drives Da Vinci into a rage. Again, it seems the Emperor's hubris is getting the better of him, seeing this battle against Caldea more like a chance to play with new toys. These tanks aren't completely useless, but all they can really do is slow us down a bit. Eventually, we're close enough to the capital that we no longer have to worry about the Emperor's orbital strikes. Before we attempt our invasion, Jing Kei announces that she wants to go on her own to try and assassinate Qin Shi Huang. Given that this is the core of her fame and legend, we let her go, but only after getting her to promise she'll return safely. Honestly, that's being pretty optimistic. When we reach the capital's entrance, we fight against members of the Royal Guard, martial artists under Li Xuan who, just like their captain, are humans being kept alive through mystic technology. Once inside, we discover that underneath Epang Palace are a number of humans, and ironically, they're all creating art. The catch is that all this art is made in Qin Shi Huang's image. 
That's quite the ego. Qin Liang Yu's in the capital, trying to evacuate its citizens when we find her. She's surprised when we choose to let her finish the evacuation before confronting her. She recognizes the irony that she's fighting for the man who destroyed her village, but she's convinced that her actions are just because humans need to have their harmful tendencies suppressed. Perhaps she has a point, that this Lost Belt's world truly is more peaceful than our own, but we wouldn't have come this far if our conviction died so easily. For the sake of our world, we fight and defeat her. Ritsuka listens to Qin Liang Yu's final concern, that progress is often achieved through bloodshed, and whether progress is actually worth that sacrifice. Meanwhile, Jin Kei makes her move, appearing before Qin Shi Huang's core. The two discuss what it means for history to be proper, and Jin Kei counters his arrogance by showing him his cell phone. He laughs at how inferior the technology is compared to his own computational power, but is alarmed when she tells him that billions of humans from her world own them. The idea that meager humans possessing gifts meant for the enlightened truly baffles him. She explains that our world encourages communication and knowledge rather than suppressing it, accepting whatever consequences emerge. It relies on chance over certainty. While this debate is fascinating, it's only a means to an end. The cell phone she had the Emperor analyze contained a virus, which has now infected him. His computational system shuts down, but somehow he remains alive in a separate body. With it, he kills Jing Kei, ensuring her failure a second time. That said, she does buy us some time as we ascend the palace. Eventually, we reunite with the Shadow Border, but Han Xin and Li Xuan aren't about to let us take it. Despite having been relieved of their duties, the two of them truly want to fight us. Our bout lasts until neither of them can stand anymore. Li passes on as if he were sleeping, and Han Xin accepts his own loss. Now, as much as Yu Mei Ren wants to run away with her husband and live peacefully, she knows Xiang Yu can't just stand by while his emperor is in danger. Thus, the two decide to confront Ritsuka together. We wind up in the palace treasury, where Sherlock figures out the fantasy tree and the Fusang tree are one and the same. Koyanskaya takes this opportunity to betray us, encouraging Yu Mei Ren to use the tree's power. Playfully, she claims that she will make another antidote, but only after Ritsuka dies. <laughs> We fight against Xiang Yu in the treasury, but Yu Mei Ren is still hesitant about revealing the fantasy tree in front of the Emperor. As such, Koyanskaya takes the initiative, awakening the tree right beside the capital's giant computer. This whole time, the Fusang tree contained all of its energy and wisdom in a pocket dimension. It was by hiding in this dimension that Mayal could grow undetected. With it finally taking form, Qin Shi Huang is forced to confront the truth, that his world is a lost belt on the verge of pruning. Sure enough, this news inspires him to preserve his world by fighting the others, and that includes Caldea. Qin Shi Huang allows his mechanical body in the air to crash onto the ground below. There, he emerges in his true body, what he considers to be the ultimate human form. Confiding in himself as the one true human, he fights Ritsuka for the sake of their respective worlds. Ironically, though, it is this human body of his that becomes his downfall. We stood no chance against his prior mechanical form, its defenses were simply too tight, but by taking on a humanoid shape, we had the chance to weaken him. He asks Ritsuko why he lost, and we respond by noting that we had the help of our many servants. It wasn't our raw strength that won at all, but rather our determination in the face of peril. Our fight is enough to convince Qin Shi Huang to admit defeat and entrust the world to Ritsuka. The conflict isn't over, however, as Xiang Yu refuses to accept such an outcome. Despite being the Emperor's pawn all this time, he now pledges himself to Yu Mei Ren, the woman who loved him. So long as she wants this Lost Belt to remain her home, he intends to defend it. That said, our previous bouts have gradually damaged his body, so this declaration is suicidal. Nonetheless, fueled by his newfound love, Xiang Yu charges us in futility. As expected, he cannot endure, and his body finally gives out. Having to experience the death of her beloved a second time, Yumei Ren succumbs to her grief. Hoping to claim her vengeance upon Caldea, she allows the fantasy tree Mayal to absorb her. The tree begins to radiate enough energy that we detect an entire galaxy within its dimension. On our own, we cannot possibly win, but thankfully Qin Shi Huang's a man of his word. Having already decided to entrust history to Ritsuka, he uses his strength to help us destroy the tree. Like the other trees before it, Mayal shatters, ejecting Yu Mei Ren, who is now dying alongside it. 
She's about to spend her final moments wallowing in despair, but Qin Shi Huang offers another solution. He explains that what Xiang Yu would most want is for her to live without hatred or remorse, to die one day with pride and confidence. He suggests that she use her remaining power as an elemental to become a heroic spirit and continue on as a servant of humanity. While she detests the idea, she understands that she would be carrying on her husband's legacy, and doing so would honor his passing. So that her beloved will not lament her fate, Yu Mei Ren takes the Emperor's advice. What she isn't quite expecting, however, is that she might literally be summoned by Ritsuka of all humans. Yeah, she's not too happy about that. Either way, the Lost Belt begins to collapse. We return to the Shadow Border and, to our surprise, we find another dose of the Fusang Tree's antidote. As evil as she is, it seems Koyanskaya is a woman of her word, too. Seriously, though, she owes us. Without our help, she'd still be a bleeding tripophobic's nightmare. So cool, we drink the antidote and are all cured up. As the storm wall disappears and the Lost Belt vanishes, the Emperor spends what little time he has left speaking to his villagers in his humanoid form. With that, the third Lost Belt has been denied. The party returns to Novum Caldea to prepare for the next venture, which happens to be the Indian Lost Belt. After I'm done streaming it on this channel, I'll be back with another lore video just like this. Look forward to it! Thanks for watching. If you enjoy this channel, help me beat the algorithm by liking, commenting, and sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and, most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all of my anime discussion, lore, or Let's Play content. If you want to support me directly, there are now three ways that all provide the same benefits. You can click Join here on YouTube, or join Patreon or Subscribestar for access to exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate your fandom!